Greetings, East Africa, and welcome to your world, an opportunity to investigate issues that affect your day-to-day -day life. Now, speaking of which, as the world grapples with the COVID-19 pandemic, Kenya is facing an additional one, and that is the ongoing healthcare workers' strike. The strike has rendered services in public health facilities inaccessible, leaving many Kenyans desperate, as many cannot afford private facilities. This morning, we relook at how we got here, why we are still here, and how we can ensure that this vicious cycle ends by catering for the welfare of our healthcare workers. My name is Gladys Gashanja, and this is what else you can expect. <laughs> We shed light on how to better cater for the welfare of the health workers. Well, Bobby Wine addresses supporters after soldiers stood down their positions around his residence. If you can get a solution, a win-win solution so that our people don't continue suffering. Back home and county governments have been urged to dialogue with the striking healthcare workers to shield the common monoinji who lacks easy access to medical care. And further afield, five baby zebra sharks, <clears throat> also known as leopard sharks, born in Europe's biggest aquarium. Thank you for joining us on this broadcast. We take stock of our healthcare system and, of course, pay special focus to the welfare of our healthcare workers this morning. So, our question of the day to you is. Have you been affected by the ongoing healthcare workers strike? Share your experience using that hashtag new normal. And of course, we shall be sharing our numbers and you can also call in or text in. But before we get to that critical conversation, let's take a look at the impact of COVID-19 around the world. And this morning, those numbers stand at 101,434,963 confirmed cases globally. Out of that number, 73,324,917 have totally recovered. 2,184,126, unfortunately, have succumbed to COVID-19. Now, in Kenya, that number is at 100,323 confirmed cases, 83,691 recovered, and 1,751 Kenyans have succumbed to COVID-19. Again, I will say this until we can all understand the importance of being very diligent is that you need to keep wearing your mask, you keep social distancing, and of course, wash your hands with water regularly. And if you do not have that, please use your alcohol based sanitizer. Now, a look at some of the stories that are making headlines on your world this morning. And uh, residents of an internally displaced camp in the northeastern Nigerian city of Maiduguri say they approve the decision by President Muhammadu Buhari to replace the country's top military commanders in a sudden overhaul after months of pressure of a deteriorating security. We want... After the insurgency have been wiped away, the IDP to return back to their normalities. That is what we want. We want to go and farm in our, our various localities. We are tired of staying in IDPs. The sacked ones have not improved what we, the IDPs want. What we want is not to repel the Boko Haram, but to kill them, to finish them at once, not to repel them again. We are repeating one thing at all the time. That is the reason why we are not after them. We want somebody that will just degrade them, complete them, whip them away. Mama! 
Elsewhere, hundreds of Tunisian anti-government protesters demonstrate near the parliament, which was guarded by riot police as lawmakers inside held a heated debate on a cabinet reshuffle. Tunisia's politics have also been turbulent and seen a deepening rift between the prime minister and head of state. President Said, an independent academic who has criticized parliamentary democracy, has been seeking to reposition himself at the center of an unstable political Political scene. The task of forming a, a government rather has become more difficult since elections in October of 2019 resulted in a parliament split among myriad parties and fragile alliances. Islamists inspired another came top in the polls but fell far short of a majority and eventually agreed to join a coalition government. <laughs> To South Africa and the country's president, Cyril Ramaphosa, wants against to rich countries bulk buying and holding coronavirus vaccine doses. Addressing the virtual 2020 World Economic Forum, Ramaphosa said low- and middle-income countries were being sidelined by wealthier nations, some of which have been able to acquire up to four times the amount needed for their population. We want vaccines as quickly as other countries do that have already started because uh, we are all not safe if some countries are vaccinating their people and other countries are not vaccinating. We all must act together in combating uh, coronavirus because it affects all of us equally. This free trade area is going to open the door for trading for African producers and manufacturers. But the other advantage is going to be in boosting manufacturing, in boosting industrialization, because all of a sudden, a market will have been opened and manufacturers, entrepreneurs, and industrialists will now know that we now have a market. While closer home, Ugandan opposition leader Bobby Wine addresses supporters after soldiers stood down their positions around his residence a day after a court ordered an end to the confinement of a presidential runners-up. Where you are seated right now, there were tents of soldiers. They jumped over the fence and took over our compound. They could not allow my wife to access our garden. They beat up our security guards and terrorized everybody that we stay with. But, I mean, that serves only to expose the kind of regime that is presiding over us. General Seven might have, you, might have used the military to assert his force and impose himself on the people of Uganda. Like I've already told you, he's an impositor who we are going to remove soon and very soon. You are special people. Amid this all the rigging, amid this all the irregularities, amid this all the violence, the people asserted their voices. Don't look at yourself like the ordinary. You are not ordinary. You are freedom fighters. You are revolutionaries. Embrace it. People power. Our power. Now back home and focusing on our conversation of the day, county governments have been urged to dialogue with the striking, striking rather healthcare workers across the country and call for a true source to shield the common monainji who now lacks easy access to medical care at the public facilities. This as a strike by the Kenya Union of Clinical Workers continues as the county governments failed to implement the return to work policy which they had signed with the Ministry of Health earlier in the year. Now, Labour Cabinet Secretary Simon Chelugui has called upon counties to join hands with the national government to bring an end to the medical workers' strike, further stating that medical management in a country is vital, further appealing to county governors to prioritize healthcare workers' welfare. At the Baringo County Referral Hospital, patients watch in agony. This often busy corridors are deserted as medical workers continue to stay away from duty. 
At the center of the standoff are remuneration and welfare concerns raised by medics in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. The government says it is in the process of finding a lasting prescription. To Mesungumza Namadaktari, the medical and pharmacist medical union, KPMDU, Sasa Tuko, Namasungumza clinicians and our nurses. And I hope before end of this month, we will be announcing nationally a formula on return to work. But as stocks continue, medical workers are digging in. The Kenya Union of Clinical Officers maintains that its members will not be coerced back to work up until their grievances are addressed. You are told you should go back to work, though we have not agreed to give you the PPEs, though we have not provided you with a comprehensive cover. And when you die, we have no capacity to compensate you. The Council of Governors, too, are not climbing down on a return to work directive. Governors say demands by healthcare workers are at all order and that certain allowances cannot be paid without the input of the Salaries and Remuneration Commission. At our end, they strike Mia Mia Kamia. I could have a mimi in Talipa. Our nurses, on the report of Kuliko Engineer, on a yard about the West of Fana, a year to West at West. Example, Pia, Tuki Ongezea, Madakta, to Ongezea, Manazes, and McClinical, and Mao, Mio Seventeen Kada, and Lassima to Pia to Angale Mamba and Madriver, to Angale Mamba Enforcement Officers, now for the country, what the body will come. Any threat to fire a clinical officer, to fire any healthcare worker can never actually go without an answer. And that is why we are saying we are not politicians. What we want is a consideration, prioritization on matters of health. The suffering of patients has caught the attention of leaders. If you can get a solution, a win-win solution so that our people don't continue suffering, especially to cure the mango of COVID. Helen Aura, NTV. So the country is in crisis. Our healthcare workers are still on strike and Wanainchi are really bearing the brunt because they cannot access medical services, especially in the public facilities. So exactly how did we get here and why is it that we keep coming back here? Let's talk about catering for the welfare of our healthcare workers and understand better how this can be done to put a stop to this in studio to help us walk this conversation is dr alan ochanji he is the vice chair of the kenya medical practitioners and dentists union in mombasa we are expecting abidan mwachi who is the secretary of kmpdu coast branch and of course joining us virtually all the way from kisumu is anna witi who is the secretary kenya national union of nurses kisumu branch thank you for joining us on this very critical conversation and uh, i'll start off with you uh, Dr. Onyanji, how did we get here and why are we still stuck here? Uh, thank you, Gladys. Uh, uh, it's very interesting, uh, the hashtag for your show, mm -hmm. the new normal. Uh, indeed, the, the constant unrest in the health sector shouldn't be the new normal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like the reconciliatory tone being extended by the Minister of Labor because the answers to all these problems lies in respecting the tripartite uh, arrangement where there's an employer, there's an employee, and then there's a conciliator. If you respect that arrangement, then it becomes very easy and things work in a very organized way. That is not what you've seen, and that's why you see this constant unrest, this constant strikes every day uh, in the health sector. And it's because uh, the employer has completely ignored uh, the fundamentals of the Constitution, which allows for right uh, to freedom of associations, uh, the right to you know, engage and have a collective bargaining agreement, and also the right to go on strike. Uh, we've seen uh, unprocedural stoppage of salaries. We've seen, uh, we've seen uh, unprocedural uh, dismissals. We've seen uh, unprocedural uh, stoppage of deductions. So these things, instead of uh, solving uh, the problems at hand, they always continue uh, making the situation that's already bad 
worse. Mm -hmm. So the answer to all these problems is normally coming to the table and respecting that tripartite agreement. Mm -hmm. Without that, uh, with the kind of statement that is being given by the Council of Governor Chair, things will always get from bad to worse. Mm -hmm. And that's why you find ourselves, you see nurses on the street, you see doctors on the street, you see clinical officers are on the street. As doctors, we have fundamental things that must be addressed. And uh, we can't be wrong all the time so that you see everyone on the street. The fact that we're seeing this thing recurring, it means there's a fundamental thing that is not being addressed. We, we, we keep on covering it and throwing it under the carpet. That it grows every day and it becomes bigger and it becomes worse. Uh huh. And speaking about the COG chair, Wycliffe Oparanya, he has reiterated over and over again that it is unfair for medical practitioners to choose a time like this to actually make their point or go on strike. Your comment? It's unfortunate because, uh, uh, as expected during the, uh, the, during the pandemic, the healthcare workers will have been protected the most because they are the, uh, they are the front line. Mm -hmm. But what we've seen is the exact opposite. Uh, they've really worked in very difficult circumstances. Uh, I'll give you an example of uh, our senior colleagues who work in the universities. They've been very instrumental during COVID. They've given invaluable services to this country. They were at the center of the COVID response team, giving advice to none other than the head of state and giving technical advice in areas that needs to be taken care of. These people, as we talk, some of them haven't even paid their allowances. They work in the universities where they don't even have a comprehensive medical cover that comes with group life. So at the point of a uh, pandemic, and you know uh, the risk of COVID is higher in advanced ages. Mm -hmm. Those who work in the universities and the professors uh, most of them are at their advanced age. They are the people who need to be protected, protected the most. Yet they work, they give invaluable services. Some of them have been recognized by the state for their outstanding services. Yet we don't even have a comprehensive medical cover for them. We don't have an allowance for them. I'll give you an example. Um, in the pandemic still, we have Kirinyaga and Laikipia doctors out of work. Uh, uh, the county government uh, uh, fired them for the basic thing that they engage in a, a lawful and protected industrial action. For more than a year, they've been out of work. Uh, another example is in Nyamira, mm -hmm. where five months had just elapsed, and I'm glad we signed to work, uh, returned to work formula with them the other day. But for five months, those doctors were out of work. In Mombasa, the governor fired, uh, fired 89 healthcare workers on very flimsy grounds. We had to stand our ground, and those doctors were returned back to work. So this is a point that, contrary to what world over uh, people are doing, redirecting their policies, redirecting their manifestos to make sure that their frontline healthcare workers are protected, we've not seen that in our country. And that's okay. why you're seeing all this unrest. Uh -huh. Now, the common Mona Inchi is the one who's caught in between, and at times they get lost in as far as what it is that the healthcare workers are looking to achieve with the strike. So... What, in point form, what are you hoping to get? We hope that uh, uh, the responsible authorities mm -hmm. will come and respect the agreements that they've entered into with the workers, especially the healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. If you look across the clinical officers, the nurses, the doctors, they have documents that have been, uh, the, the government and the responsible bodies have appended their signatures. Mm -hmm. We have a CBA with all the uh, 47 county governments we have a CBA, a CBA implementation matrix. If the counties were to be truthful and respectful and respect that document that we deposited in court and implement the clauses within that document, you wouldn't see us on the street mm -hmm. because the doctors will be promoted on time, will not have stagnation, will have a comprehensive medical cover, a uh, framework for training mm -hmm. will be outlined, and uh, we'll have a framework where if you have a problem, you have a mechanism for solution. What we've seen is that instead of uh, the responsible people coming to the table and uh, confining ourselves to this agreement, mm -hmm. they resort to threats, intimidation, sackings, stoppage of salaries. Those will never solve any problem.
Uh-huh. Okay, now we know the nurses reiterated the other day they are not going back to work. If we can have that story on the auto queue, and they have said they will not be coerced and uh, intimidated to going back to work because they believe what they're fighting for is for the good of the country at the end of the day, and there is no reprieve for public hospitals hoping to normalize their operations. <clears throat> now, the National Union of Nurses confirmed Tuesday that the strike is still on, even though the Bungoma nurses represent Representatives said they reached an agreement with the county government. On the other hand, the chair of the Council of Governors is adamant that he will not give in to the demands of nurses, however long that will take. The health workers maintain the industrial action is necessary so that their grievances can be addressed. But the strike has left many Kenyans in a desperate situation, especially those unable to seek alternative care in private facilities. Though sympathetic, the Secretary General representing 30,000 nurses around the country says it is only county governments that can make them change their stance in the stalemate. Ule mwafaka wakurudi kazini ni lazima utiwe sahihi katika kitengo cha kitaifa. Kwa sababu tunajua kwamba Hela zote ambazo zinaendesha inji hii zinatoka kwa serikali kuu kupitia bunge. Kwa hivyo hatuwezi kuhadaliwa kwamba mambo haya yanaweza kutekelezwa na serikali za katuzi kule chini. Their demands, he says, are well known and won't change. Tunashiriki mgomo mpaka wakati ambapo mambo yetu ambayo tumeuliza serikali yatatekelezwa. Right now, the Kenyans on the ground are really, really, really suffering. Nobody is talking about the strike. The nurse's representative is struggling with what he sees as the arrogance of the Council of Governors chair, who seems oblivious to the health crisis that the strike is causing. Meanwhile, in Bungoma, the story is very different. The governor and nurse's representative in the county have reached a deal. We've had all the salaries paid on time in all our members' accounts. And uh, going forward is that that place is actually going to be maintained. This afternoon, we have managed to get a breakthrough with the union officials, Bungoma branch, and they have agreed in principle to suspend the strike so that our nurses can get back to work in the next 48 hours. The Secretary General of the Nurses Union, however, says that this development in Bungoma has not been sanctioned by their National Governing Council. Mark Masai, NTV. So the nurses are still on strike and they are part of a bigger uh, family of medical practitioners that are on strike. And uh, joining us from Kisumu is Anu Witi, who is the Secretary of Kenya National Union of Nurses, Kisumu branch. And uh, we know earlier in the month, the county government of Kisumu let go of over 400 nurses and also stopped paying them their salaries, considering that today is the 28th of January. Is there a hope that you will be paid? Thank you so much for hosting me in this show. And I want to extend my greetings to all the, the Kenyans who are watching us now. I would start by saying that we are sympathizing with the situation on the ground in the country. But as at now, there's really nothing much that we can do before we reach an agreement. The situation in Kisumu, as you rightly put it, is very disappointing. Over 400 nurses have been struck off the payroll. Our employer is saying he does not know where we are. I'm wondering what he means because we gave a strike notice and we are on strike and he knows we are on strike. The notice is with him on his desk. So when he says he doesn't know where we are, I'm a bit challenged, I don't know what to say. But it is true, our salaries have been stopped and we are being threatened with a lot of sack letters. So we have been talking to this county government. If I hear the, the Honorable Baranya saying 
that uh, we should go and talk to the, with the with the counties i don't know in kisumu we have noticed so many times kisumu health workers on strike that is an effect of negotiations that are not honored we go in we talk and the same same situation take for example the delay in salaries okay now kisumu has uh, come up with uh, a tentative arrangement of paying in time but paying only the basic but our salary also involves the gross we need our gross salary in kisumu he have represented nurses who are accused of dual employment because they want to, they went to do low, low come elsewhere so it is only when you pay the, the, the gross, our loan deduction, that we are able to access loans and manage our things. Mm -hmm. When we talk about uh, the risk allowances, the risk allowances you are told cannot be sorted at the county level. That's why we are here, because we are told the, the SRC must give in their input. That cannot be done at the county level. So how do we go on this? That's a good thing at the county. There's the statutory deductions, including NHIF. Our members, the other day there was one member of mine who was to access care at there that and was referred by the EMG surgeon to Nairobi for treatment. She went and came back because I asked her abuse had not reached the NHIF. Imagine a sick person coming back to follow issues with NHIF instead of getting treatment. These issues are still piling, piling up. The confirmation of the, 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 the contract employees. Come to Kisumu and see the number of contracts we have. Some people have been contracted for six months, some people one, one year, some people three years. Some people were contracted for three years and were requested to return their, their contract letters and were given a lesser contract of one year. It is all a mess. That's why we were saying, let everybody be employed on permanent and pension. And if that one cannot be done, let them be employed as for the, the, the regulations so that they also enjoy the other benefits that the others are enjoying. And in, we, we are also out because we want standard PPEs. Standard PPEs and the quality. In Kisumu, there is PPE, yes, we made noise and we, we made noise and the PPEs are are adequate, but they are not standard, and we want standard. We don't want to go there in and, and start dying. Our families need us. Of course, the issues of CBA that is still making us to come out. Mm -hmm. 2017, we had a national strike that took so long. That CBA today has not been finalized. Seven years down the line. The comprehensive medical cover, honestly, if, we, if others are having comprehensive cover, others are not having, and even that comprehensive cover, you want a scan, you want an MRI, you have to wait for two days for authorization. This is a patient we are talking about. It is not somebody who's just walking in for maybe medical checkup or something. So we, we also wanted the compensation. As we are talking about 34 nurses, I've, have succumbed to COVID, and we were saying their relatives must be compensated. And you know when money, when money issues are involved, then it must be handled at the national. Now we are being told that we don't want to negotiate with the counties. You go to the counties and they tell you, as we are ready, so long as the national. So it is a ping pong game. And we are saying the court advised all of us to go and negotiate. And that negotiation, negotiation should be represented in court, I think, today. Mm -hmm. So that we see where we are free. But now instead we are seeing the governor throwing once and saying, I can't pay, won't pay. So I don't know whether these are the things that will be presented in court today. We are yet to see, we are waiting to see. Okay, and now you've detailed exactly what the nurses would like to uh, be looked into. And uh, again, going back to the COG chair, he has been quoted and was even heard in the previous report saying that he will not pay nurses an extra coin because if he does, they'll actually even earn more than the engineers and it will just inflate the county budgets. When you hear them compare nurses and other civil servants and what they earn. What does that mean to you? Or what does that make you feel? That one is not going to move me at all because what I do and what the engineers do are very different. If the engineers feel that they should be compensated, they need risk allowance, well and good. They go and negotiate with their employer. But we are not going to go in without PPEs 
because engineers are not going to be added their money. That one cannot happen. You know, when I die, it is my family that will gain the loss. Mm -hmm. It is my people will sympathize with that situation and my family. But the end result is that it is my family who will go to that loss. Nobody will say that anyway, I you sacrificed so well. You see, the engineers were also not paid. Now you were also not paid. You died, may you rest in peace. So a matter of salary should be an issue between the employer and the employee. If the engineers are satisfied, that should now surely not be put on nurses. We are not to be blamed for that. Okay, now back to you, Daktari. I mean, we got here when the doctors came out and said, enough is enough, we are losing so many of our colleagues. And then now this started this whole other ripple effect, and it all started with the need for better protective gear at work and better working conditions. Yeah. The question Ningiz and somebody is asking, if we never had COVID, would you have gone on strike? Uh, we've gone on strike before. Yes. We were on strike on... Uh, 2016 2017 for 100 days and it was our hope that that would have been the last strike because uh, the issues back then were very dear to us and we captured all of them in a document which as I've told you uh, uh, sections of it many sections have been violated mm -hmm. if that document was uh, implemented to the lot we wouldn't be where we are today because I'll tell you in that document it describes how you engage in terms of employment. Right now we are having junior contracts, very short junior discriminatory contracts. You find uh, an advert that gives you accumulated salary of X amount, yet in the document it describes how much an entry level should get, how much once you've progressed you should get. Uh, the same, same person doing the advert is the same person who signed the document and agreed to the terms. Uh, employment, for example, you know, we really have a strained workforce and uh, more of, of our colleagues have gone into isolation and then the ones who are advanced in age have to take lesser duties and uh, not be at the forefront. So with that strained workforce, you're having more than 2,000 trained doctors in this country who are jobless, who are unemployed and who are staying at home. When we are saying that we just need their places to be filled up, we mean very well. And uh, if that's what it takes to take us on strike, we'll go on strike not because of uh, what we want to do or what we want to achieve, but because we want to protect the monarchy. Because uh, it's very sad if you would get a case where there's COVID outbreak the way it is. Someone goes to the hospital, instead of finding a doctor, they'll be there on their own, no one to take care of them. Instead of finding a nurse, they'll be there on their own. So we must find a way of handling employment. The other thing is um, the issue of the PPEs. Mm -hmm. We heard that the PPEs are in uh, a warehouse somewhere in Embakas. The PPEs are meant to be in the hospitals. They were meant not to be kept there. So if you're making noise and going on strike, it's because that is the last option. How would you leave your house knowing so well that I'm going to work? but I'm not protected. If anything happens to me, who will take care of me? And that happens at a point where there's no platform of compensation. You don't have a group life cover. And as I've told you, some of our senior colleagues work. Um, the professor of urology who passed on, mm -hmm. uh, they died at a point where they don't have comprehensive medical cover. We have colleagues who died uh, in Eldoret and to Nairobi. The, wh while they were traveling to come and get ICU bed in Nairobi, they were busy organizing a WhatsApp group so that they can get a deposit for ICU. So these are things we go through, and when you see healthcare workers downing their tools, it's never uh, something that we're proud of, but sometimes it comes as a point where that is a measure of last resort. We've engaged, we've participated in conciliatory meetings, we've written letters, some of them have been ignored. So when we come out on the street, it's just expressing our displeasure with the slow pace and uh, the way things are being done that's not addressing the basic issues for our time. So the pandemic just came to exacerbate the situation that was there in the first place. In fact, if you look at countries that have really done well in terms of COVID, mm -hmm. they've had preparedness as number one factor. COVID came, yes, as a pandemic, but it's way better if you're organized in terms of handling human resources, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of commodity and supply, and in terms of financing health, 
if you put those four ingredients together, even if you get a pandemic, today we're in COVID, uh, the other time we were in Ebola, another would come. We also have TB, we have diabetes, we have malaria. These things will always be there, but they come, uh, it becomes very easy to handle them if you're prepared and you put health as a priority. Mm -hmm. Because in the Constitution, every Kenyan is guaranteed and is assured of highest tenable health standards. Uh -huh. Okay, so the doctors in Mombasa actually downed their tools and went on strike, but came to an agreement with the county government, even after going through that whole episode of over 80 of their colleagues being let go by the county government for being on strike. So we are now joined by Abidan Moji, who is the secretary for the KMPDU at the Coast Branch. And everyone is asking, what is it that the county government did right to get your attention enough for you to go back to work? Um, uh, th th thank you Gladys. Uh, uh, the situation in Mombasa was less than uh, perfect. Uh, let me just say, uh, uh, 86 of our doctors got sacked for demanding what I would call very basic rights. But that is what it was. I mean, that was the lowest, uh, abysmal point that we ever sunk to, and we wish that we never get there. Uh, you know, um, a strike in the healthcare sector uh, usually uh, creates no winners. Uh, but it's what you call a pyrrhic victory. That even if you won, the, the the losses made along the way in terms of people suffering and all that. It's really even not toward the victory that comes. Um, so to say that, uh, however, here we chose the uh, uh, path of engagement, and 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 we engaged in very tough diplomacy. It, it was forced upon us that you have to sit down and agree, because uh, this was a very tough time. COVID had ravaged. If you can remember, Mombasa was only second to Nairobi in terms of the high numbers. And our members were working without insurance, our members were working without a salary, our members were paying bills in the, in the hundreds of thousands uh, during the ravishing of, of a pandemic. So uh, it, it came as a last resort, but it had to be done. Um, I owe you a very sorry uh, state in counties like Laikipia and Kirinyaga, where doctors have been sacked and there doesn't seem to be any end in sight. Uh, when you look at the entirety of things, uh, you can guess, like we do, that uh, health, health in this country is only used as a campaign slogan, nothing more than that. They put flowery words, poetic words, only when they're campaigning, but after that, nothing, nothing much comes out of it. How will you explain a country of 45 to 50 million uh, people and has 2,000 doctors out there unemployed? And we only have about 4,000 4, doctors for the entire population. We don't really uh, mean we, uh, the words that we say when you're out there in the campaign platforms. And it, it, it's, it's a sorry state, yes. Okay, now what is it that the county government did right to get you back to work? Yes, yes. Now, well, we chose the path of engagement. I, I know egos were high and, and uh, the, the, uh, really, really, I mean, both sides are taking a very uh, tough stunt, but we chose a part of the engagement to engage the Senate. We wrote a petition to Senate, and it's Senate through the senator who mediated those talks. And also the very senior colleagues in the profession uh, through Kenya Medical Association who came to mediate. And so we weren't uh, speaking as a bipartite uh, 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 conversation. We had a tripartite where we had senior colleagues on this side and we had the county government on that side. And uh, so the entirety of the picture was like we're trying to find a solution and we had to find it really fast. So we did. Yes, that's what we did. All right. And now that you're back to work, have all your grievances been met? Um, not, not even close. Not even close. Like, you can remember the issues about statutory deduction that was very, very dear to our members, whereby uh, the loans are not being paid, and now, they haven't even been paid up to now. Uh, so they will get money in their accounts, but the banks now will deduct that money. So our members are going without salaries, still are. 
But when you looked at uh, the resolution of that, you know, it, it, it was so clear that it will never be resolved in within an industrial action. Mm -hmm. But now once you put pen to paper and now come, come up with a document and deposit it in court, I mean, that was good assurance. Because, you know, a strike in the healthcare sector doesn't need to be protect, uh, protracted, uh, not less if you want to end up with another Pyrrhic victory, where the losses made along the way are just too big. Uh -huh. yes. Okay, so we see that the county government of Mombasa was able to convince their doctors to go back by meeting them halfway, which means with health being a devolved unit, each county is capable of catering for their needs of the medical practitioners in the counties. Now, the other day, Bungoma County seemed to have agreed with the nurses and they said they will go back to work. But the union said they do not recognize the same. The question to you, Anne, even as you speak to the county government of Kisumu and you agree, would you go back to work or do you still await a go ahead from the union? It will depend on the matter we are discussing. If the matter is what is on the table now, maybe Kisumu County government, the way they talk to us will not be able. Because the issues of risk allowance, they said they have to wait for a go ahead, meaning they will only confirm when the go ahead is given by the national team. And that's why we are requesting them as a county to involve and talk to the governor so that they talk to one another, come on the table and we sort out this matter. Issues of statutory deduction. This is something we have been talking daily with Kisumu. We talk, it goes for a period, then it comes back. It goes, comes, goes for a period and comes back. And we are saying, we are tired of these strikes. There's no need of going inside only for us to come out again. Let the matter be put to rest so that we can give the services that we were trained to give. And not always at loggerheads with our employers. Let them sort out this issue once and for all. So that when we go back, we go back, not that, like now, that superficial coverage that now we go back, it's like dressing a wound and you're not cleaning it. You go back without anything solved. It means it is just another bomb in waiting. You'll go back and come out again. Is that what Kenyans want? We want that when we go back, we go back and we serve Kenyans. And the employers also stick to their promise. As we are standing now, they have promised nothing. They have said, we won't pay, can't pay. Surely, can you go back with such a statement? We have to reach an agreement. And that is why there is negotiation. And that's why it is before a mediator. We all go in and say what we want. Then okay, after the mediation now, we can say, okay, as these matters are being sorted, let us now go back. But which matters are being sorted now as we speak? Nothing, nothing. It's just we are seeing the politicians, especially the chair of the COG, saying and throwing what he has even said he has employed 60 to replace the over 1,000 nurses that are in that county. I'm, I'm wondering how 60 can bridge 1,000. So it is so unfair for the Kenyans, and Kenyans are left suffering for a long time. They cannot even go to the private institutions, it is pathetic. Even as we are suffering. Mm -hmm. Now, if we agree to go back and then I'm sick, my NHIF is not updated. Is that a type of going back that we want? No, we want something sorted out so that we relax. You know, as a medic, if you are on duty and you are not settled psychologically, how will you even make that diagnosis? How will you identify what the patient is suffering from? We want to go in an environment that we are free, that we are not mentally disturbed, that we can exercise what we were taught. Uh-huh. Okay, now I think Kenyans have been watching the government go at it with the medical practitioners, Alan, and uh, at times all it looks like is these professionals that are at each other. But at the end of the day, you're human beings just like the next guy. Paint a picture for us, especially in the pandemic, how life has been such a difficult journey to walk as a medic? It's very difficult because as a medic, you're human as well. You go to work and uh, you hope to uh, reconnect with your family sometimes after work. But you go to work knowing so well that uh, you're going to expose yourself and you're not adequately protected like a frontline soldier. By that, you carry the very heavy risk of taking the disease back home. Uh, we had given a proposal that uh, at your areas of work, you're given uh, some sort of uh, a holding facility and an isolation center, where if, let's say, you get uh, 
uh, the disease, you're able to be contained in an area so that you don't transmit it back home. We've not had that. We've had our colleagues dying. Like, they cannot benefit from the services they, 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 they deliver. Our colleague died in KU. He's called Dr. Njorog. Mm. At the point when he was dying, one thing he said, uh, may I see my medical bill? Because perhaps he had seen that uh, he might not win the battle. But at that point when he was grappling with that thought in his mind, only one thing he was caring about, will my family be able to take care of this bill? That's why when you're talking about medical cover, is very dear to us. Uh, there's a story that trained for us sometimes when we lost our young colleague, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mogusu. I'm sure you were aware of that. Yes. Uh, the guy died at a point when he didn't even put his eyes on the patient. He worked for five months. This is a person who gave his best to his country at the point of need, at the point when we're at our lowest. It's like sending a soldier to Somalia. That person died without the salary, uh, without protection, without compensation. Right now, the young family and the young kid are on their own. So we are also human. When we say these things, you know that we're making it sensational. Mm -hmm. We just want basic things that will allow us to work and will allow us to carry out our duty. Most of us, the only thing that we know is medicine, nursing, uh, being a clinical officer. We're not politicians. So when we come out and say these things, some of them think that we are taking a political angle. Far from the truth. As we just want to be enabled to work in an enabling environment, that's all. Mm -hmm. Now, Abidan, you work in an environment where, unfortunately, you face death on a daily. And then now the pandemic comes around and it totally exacerbates the situation. As a doctor who has to cater for Kenyans on a daily, what is going through your mind every morning you walk through the doors of that hospital? Um, Gladys, it's, it's always tough. Uh, there are two, the two aspects of it. There is what goes through my mind when I walk into the hospital and also what goes through my mind when I get back home. So uh, let me start when I get to the hospital. And uh, basically it's like you're also just walking through uh, uh, eggshells and you're superintending upon death and you know that uh, you're not immune to it. When you get home after being exposed, you're exposing it to your family. I, I had the unfortunate experience of having contracted COVID two times, and it, it wasn't funny, right? You know, uh, with no isolation place, you have to pay bills from your own pockets, and you also have to worry about your family, how to protect them, so you have to isolate yourself by your own means. And, and remember, that was the time where we were being told that you need to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, even though you're, you're essentially barefoot because there was no salary incoming because of our loans. Uh, 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 having said that, this, is, this situation has just brought to the fore the, the kind of suffering and, and lopsided, uh, 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 whatever, lo lopsided decisions that our governments usually make. We are exposed to these issues every day, multi-drug resistant TB, the other TB. We are exposed to needle pricks because of HIV. And the health, health, health cover is barely sufficient. And this is on a daily basis. COVID has just exacerbated it. Uh, and, and because now it's a worldwide pandemic, that's why it's been brought to the fore. But these are issues that we go through every single day. Okay, and Anne, I would like to understand, you keep saying in the news amongst your fraternity that your colleagues are passing away because of this pandemic and you still have to show up for work and it's taking a toll on your mental health. How do you manage all this despite what you have to deal with on a daily? If I'm to talk for Kisumu, there is arrangement, there is one of us, one of our nurses who has a team of counselors who normally tries and talk to us. But as a human being, even after they talk to you, and like I told you earlier, about 34 nurses have died due to this COVID. You just keep on asking yourself, am I the next one? And you see in medical, we are going on duty up to 60 years of age. The other professionals were allowed to work at home, but you know, the risks are still the same. The risks are the same. 
whether you are in medical profession or not. The way that person who is working from home, who is over 55, is the same same risk that is there. So we are there with those comorbidities. There's people with hypertension. There are some of our colleagues with diabetes. Some are immunosuppressed. And you have to just go. So you are there and you have that fear. And that fear is worsened by you knowing that the, 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 the PPE you are using is not of standard. So it really wears you down. Some of us are single parents, you know, you are the only breadwinner in your family. So you keep on wondering, if I go with this COVID, what next? And by the way, it's not only COVID. As Dr. Alan has put it very straight, we are having these risks every day. There is hepatitis. There is all sorts of risks in the hospital. So all we want is to be assured of some sort of immune. Like if the PPEs let them not be kept somewhere in a store, let them be rolled out and we can get them and go in there contented. Even soldiers, when they go to war, they don't go barehanded. The government normally buys the right gadgets for them. And that is exactly what we are asking for. Because as we are speaking, as much as we are being told to go back, we know that the PPEs are still not of standard. So what are we now trying to say? Just to go back, keep on dying, we are going to solve. It cannot work like that. It is very difficult. It is demoralizing. In fact, that mental status will even make us not to perform as is needed. Imagine the nurse who is in the isolation ward. You are there and you know all these cases have been confirmed and you are still there, knowing very well that the PPE that I'm putting on may be is not of the standard quality. So what we are saying, let us as Kenyans, all of us, let's give health priority. A healthy nation is the only nation can, that can walk in and vote anything in. A healthy nation can produce. A healthy nation can work together happily. But now when they, their health, nobody cares about, most of the facilities are locked, people are traveling at home, they even approach us in our houses thinking we can help them. We cannot also help them. We don't have medicine in our houses. So we are really frustrated, as you put it. And we really ask the government to move in with speed so that this statement can be sorted out. Mm -hmm. They had reached some agreement in the negotiation, and now the Council of Governors said they were not consulted, and their representatives were there. Can they please go to the table? We are requesting them. So that because in that return to work agreement that is there waiting signature, it is indicated that immediately they are signed. Within 24 hours, I'm assured you, no nurses will be back on duty. Uh -huh. And we shall be working. Okay. You hear it here on your world and kind of understand better that uh, these doctors, nurses, clinical officers, at the end of the day when they remove that coat, they are still human as you are. And this is what they are hoping that the government will come and actually address. Now, when we come back, there are lessons that we have drawn from the pandemic and clearly some muscle that has come out of this pandemic that has shown that the healthcare infrastructure can do better if prioritized. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But before I take the break, we had asked you, have you been affected by the current ongoing health workers strike? Talk to us that hashtag is new normal. And uh, we have a few coming through. We have Noble who says in any situation, a healthy workers, health workers on strike hinders many developmental milestones more when it comes to lives. Last one here from David Miles who says, no, I have an insurance policy that I use in private hospitals for all my medical needs. Well, you represent a very small percentage of Kenyans and the greater percentage cannot afford to go to a private facility. And we'll be talking about that in a moment. Stay with us.
gentlemen boys and girls biu ya mkambo imelia na hakika kuna isu nzito number one source of entertainment news culture reviews what's hot and what's not introducing where to me this is a very different platform this is an international platform you know zifahamu stories zote kwa husu ah the one is not true utajua more about top artist lifestyle time ya god ni time ya god hallelujah what they up to when not in studio or on stage that's what i do right now that's one my dad my family is so big hapa tutakuletea update zote about all the trendy and popular entertainment events kwanza Kenya East Africa and Africa and of course kuzi countdown the top 10 hottest 254 tracks all your requests pamoja na surprise kibao mambo vipi kama kawaida is your girl ada sana niko ndani ya quick mix on NTV join me your boy Ted Agwa right here on your favorite channel Super TV your source of all great 411 and so much more This is Fact Finder from the BBC. Africans in diaspora are trooping to Ghana. We look at how the media is covering the year of return. Africa Check digs into claims about Nigeria's garbage problem. We'll tell you what they found out. I think it cut across and affected very many people and a lot of people are concerned. We hear from a Kenyan investigative journalist who tells us what it took to produce an explosive expose. And a dance moves choreographed by artificial intelligence the man behind it says it enhances dancers creativity Did you know Did you know at Ruiru Mabati factory you can open an account and leap up pole pole at your convenience Did you know at Ruiru Mabati factory you can get customized sizes according to your roof plan to avoid wastage Did you know Ruiru Mabati factory offers free delivery countrywide within 72 hours Call us now on 0111050700 Ruiru Mabati factory Malisa fi kobeipo Thank you for staying with your world. My name is Gladys Gashanja. Today we are speaking more about how to cater or better cater for the welfare of healthcare workers as you know they are on strike and this has paralyzed healthcare services in public facilities. Still in studio with me Dr. Alan Ochanji Vice Chair KMPDU. We're also joined by Abidan Mwachi who is a secretary KMPDU Coast Branch and uh, Anna Witi Secretary Kenya National Union of Nurses Kisumu Branch and also now joined by Yinkas Shokunbi who is a health news editor joining us from Nigeria thank you all for staying with us and I'll cross over to Nigeria so that we are able to release her now uh okay before we hear from Yinkas I hear that you would like to contribute to this conversation please reach us on that number at the bottom of your screen William what is your question or comment Okay thank you very much I would like to make a contribution with the uh, with regard, regard to the uh, session which is currently going on so what I, I want to start by saying that Kenya is currently on a, a deathbed Car Kenya is on its knees health wise it is quite unfortunate that uh, health which is a very a very very critical docket is left uh, to, to 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 this uh, political elite who are not currently handling this matter at hand I, I strongly feel that uh, The healthcare workers are also human beings like any other person that needs to be listened to and their issues need need to be addressed then um, even if it means taking uh, going for even uh, two years for this strike for this issue to be solved once and for all then i think it it, it takes that thing to for, to for 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 it to go that way so that we don't have this same same scenario it is quite unfortunate unfortunate that when these healthcare workers needs what is rightfully there then everything gets to the darker side nobody is ready to address this issue and who suffers most look at this we have 
when two bulls are fighting, at the end of the day, it is the common monainchi down here who are suffering. So can this issue be resolved once and for all in such a way that in the near future we don't encounter a similar scenario? And, and, and let this issue, I, I strongly feel that it should be something that, that should be addressed. We need to give it a, a, a more priority. There are so many things that we see even in the, in the, in the, in the, in the television which are going on, the political things which are not even of great importance. Why can't we give health? a first priority. Health, you can only proceed to those kind of other things if you are healthy. Yeah. So I think the, the issue here is very emotive that needs to be given a very uh, uh, an upper hand and need not to be to, to, to be uh, sidelined. Even if it takes for going for two years, three years, let it be people strike and we solve this issue that we ne we, ne we we end up with no strike even for the next 10 years. Yeah. Thank you, William, for calling in and for your contribution and, of course, underscoring the need to prioritize health care. And speaking of which, Alan, eyes on the county assemblies as the IBC clears BBI bill as a push for a referendum for the same actually builds momentum. And this is a process expected to, you know, cost billions. As you see a lot of effort being put on that side, and here you are saying, just do the minimum for us. What is going through your mind? A lot, but before I respond to that, uh, let me pick it from one of our listeners yes. who mentioned uh, something that uh, he has a private insurance cover, so he has not been affected. Uh -huh. um, that's a very a slightly risky statement because um, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a Moshimiwa who died in Western Kenya. Uh, he died because there was no oxygen in any of the local facilities. You might be having your pri a private insurance, but you might get an emergency where the only hope you have is a public facility that is next to you. So it's, it's very important that we uh, find ways of making sure that our public hospitals are working. The other thing is uh, you might have a cover with one million as a limit. God forbid if you were to land in ICU in Nairobi or Australia, one million, you'll be there for three or two days and your cover will be over will be transferred back to the public hospitals. So our effort as the middle class and people are informed should be to push an agenda that will guarantee public health of higher standards and uh, does not have any limit to all Kenyans. And uh, that's why I find fault in uh, pushing health to 47 different uh, levels, the, 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 the devolution. Because that means we have 47 different standards of health. Because Machakos will not be the same as Migori, will not be the same as Mombasa. Yet, when you get cholera outbreak in Mandera, Wajia is at risk, Nairobi is at risk, Mombasa is at risk. So if you find it important to, to handle security at a central level, if you find it important to handle education at a central level, we must also find a way of handling health as a national issue at a central level. Mm -hmm. Now back to the BBI debate. You know, I don't know. I've I've had like there's a, a 14 billion set up somewhere mm -hmm. to take care of uh, the campaign and, and the BBI and and you know it's just it's just laughable because uh, if you were to pump in 14 billion in health right now, you'll have 47 different hospitals with very high standards, including I, ICU. We only have about 300 ICU spaces in the whole country. That's why our colleague who died, he will not get a ICU bed in Nakuru. He will not get it in Eldoret. He will not get it in Naivasha. He had to come to Nairobi and got, uh, unfortunately died before getting to Nairobi. Even in Nairobi, Nairobi Hospital and Agakan were completely full. If you were to pump 14 billion, it means we'll have 47 hospitals in every county with ICU space, with enough oxygen, with enough workers, with enough equipment that allows us response to emergencies. Mm -hmm. If you were to pump 14 billion, we'll have all the 2,000 healthcare workers who are trained, employed. If you were to pump 14 billion, you wouldn't be talking about inadequacy in terms of PPEs. Mm -hmm. So for us, just give us even a half of that, it will change the life of Kenyans and it will make sure that we have a motivated workforce. Mm -hmm. And still on priorities, Abidan, I mean, in this pandemic, we saw ICU hospitals and spaces and beds come up in record time, showing clearly that if there is prioritization, we have the muscle to get our healthcare infrastructure 
in place. What are some of these lessons that we can draw from this pandemic and, of course, into the future? Absolutely, Gladys. Uh, we've seen, we've, we've risen our numbers of ICU beds. I think from 227 uh, that was there, uh, right now we, we have uh, so much space, so much ICU spaces coming up in all counties, meaning that we're just like last year before, like a desical way of uh, doing things. And uh, we can do better. We're just uh, probably uh, just primed to work under strenuous circumstances, and that's when we act. Now, moving forward, I, I think uh, we wouldn't want to come out as to stop what uh, these politicians want to do with the BBI debate. They know they're doing it. Uh, what they're saying is that they can do that at the same time as we are having a conversation about uh, healthcare. I mean, politics is their business, healthcare is ours. They have their reasons for doing the BBI debates and all of that. We can't come out as to sound like we are opposing or we are supporting will, uh, at the end of the day, remain as uh, healthcare workers. Uh, we, we have our role, which is primed. Now, uh, when you look at what was done uh, during this pandemic, it just tells you that we have so much capacity, so much potential. Kenyatta University Hospital has, has, has become a premier hospital. Now when you look at hospitals like Coast General, they have also become premier hospitals with so much ICU space. Can you believe it? You just had 220-something beds the entire country. Right now I think we are bordering on a thousand and something ICU space. I think we'll take the stock after, after the pandemic is over. But well, well, I mean it's just exposed, not our underbelly, but our capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that we are able to do so much uh, for healthcare. Okay, now Alan has mentioned something interesting that uh, eight years on, I mean, since the devolution became part and parcel of our day to day, and of course, the devolved function of health went to all the 47 counties. He prefers if it went back to the national government, right? Is that what you're saying? way of managing human resource. Okay. Yes. All right. So I would like to hear from An. With all the grievances you listed, do you think this would be better handled probably back at the national government or having somebody else away from the counties handle the business of health? Thank you. From, from what I've seen, everybody is driving their agenda. Politicians are busy with their agenda. We can now see them in the BBI, which is good. We cannot say it is bad. It is their role as politicians to do that. What we are saying is prioritization. Let us prioritize and balance because, as I said earlier, you can only take a, a, a nation that is well onto the ballot to vote. A sick nation will not vote. We are in a pandemic, for God's sake. And we have been told that the, the, the second wave is even deadlier. God forbid, if it waves its way through us, and now we get a real crisis in the country, in the situation that we are in right now, what will happen? You know, those, those figures, they are given daily. And I don't see the politicians taking them seriously. They can tie another way. They can be very devastating and uh, we can go the wrong side. So what we are saying, why don't we prioritize health, make sure everything in health is running the way that it should run, so that even if we are talking to members of the public, we are sure that their health is being taken care of. What we want is a centralized way of managing health, centralized way, so that we have uniformity. Not like the other time Machakos was already enacting their return to work formula for almost five months. They were stopped on the way. And you see, others are not getting, like now you are saying, Bugoma has gone back. Now they have gone back how? They have gone back with nothing. We want a centralized system so that the, the decisions are made centrally for all the health institutions so that the referrals can be done in a better way. Mm -hmm. That is what we are asking for. The okay. BBI, it is, we cannot stop it. The politicians are right. They know what they are doing. It is their mandate. But let there be a balance. Let us not talk politics throughout and forget our health. Uh -huh. It is very bad. It is unhealthy for everybody. 
Okay, now we have another caller online, Richard from Tanda River. What's your question or comment? Uh, my comment is uh, related to the same thing that uh, my sister is speaking about. I'm an athlete. I am an Hello. Hello, we are having an issue with your connection. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, uh, my comment is related to what my sister from teaching is constituting on. We, we really face so many challenges as health partners. For example, we are exposed to health hazards. Then, number two, we also have issues with the uh, elimination. For example, you you face a situation in which uh, you are exposed to the patient with COVID-19 uh, 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 disease. You don't have PPE. When you we try, for example, I can talk about Canada. We tried a few days ago. Our current government is actually We are back. back. The same condition that we were put initially, we are in the same pattern. No PPD. Uh, we still face the same pattern. Mm -hmm. You cannot stop working because you're victimized. You get these situations we face every day. Then, yeah, the national government now on a PPI campaign. I see an national leader with a trade of leader flying over that, spending 14 billion shillings. Here you face a patient without uh, mask, without gloves, without the best necessity. But here is a person who is saying, you really don't. I heard the other day the prime, the former prime minister saying, but mm -hmm. we, 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 we pay the health care workers expensively. Uh, they are like, they are no, they are like oh, any other, any other worker. If we are like any other worker, the risk that we are exposed to, and we are like soldiers in the, in the field. For mm -hmm. example, you cannot take an army to fight an enemy without weapons. True. Without morale. Mm -hmm. What did you expect this person would be thinking about family? When this person comes back with the same situation, he's not going to give him to what is supposed to be given to the one else. So you think a healthy worker will be tough? Mm -hmm. the, way man, the way the, the manager presents, he's very bitter, he's very emotional, he makes rational decisions which affect the, the worker. We hear you. We hear you. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. And uh, these are the issues that are being brought up by the healthcare workers and especially in as far as catering for the welfare is concerned. I'm told we have Margaret from Migori also on the line. Margaret, what's your question or comment? Yeah, hello, Gladys. Uh, thank you for having me. I am just surprised that we are still talking about this issue. I am so surprised that we are still talking about this issue of health workers. Mm -hmm. It is so sad that in Kenya we are talking about health workers not being looked after. They know very well that um, without help, you cannot do anything. And I was thinking that this was going to be the first priority for these politicians to help these health workers do what they are doing. Because blood is if uh, these politicians are sick, where do, not, do they normally go? They normally go to hospitals. They are treated by the doctors, by these nurses. These people are always on the news. And they don't even think of these workers. Mm -hmm. 
Now, who is suffering gladly? Is the poor Mwanaiti that normally votes for them? Is that fair? Surely, should we be talking about this thing day in, day night? And these people know very well that without help, the country cannot even go on. Very true, so Margaret. I think the most important thing Gladys, is health. And these people should sort out these doctors and nurses. So because look at what, how much the politicians use. They spend a lot of money going around campaigning. They spend a lot of money on these hotels and everything. Mm -hmm. Honestly speaking, health is most important. That's the Thank most important you. thing. Thank you, Margaret from Miguri, for calling in and for your contribution. Priorities clearly need to be relooked in, be relooked. And uh, speaking of which, let's bring in Yinkas Shankunbi, who is the health news editor from Nigeria. Now, Nigeria's health system has been said to be quite a frail system, but uh, the country is still hanging in there. And uh, Africa's most populous country is now seeing a spike of the COVID-19 infections. How is the situation on the ground, Yinkas? Um, thank you very much for bringing me in. Uh, glad to see you once again. Uh, I must let you know that um, truly it is a sad commentary. Um, listening to um, the callers, um, I don't think there is anything you know, different from what you have in your country and what we have in our country. We are called the most populous nation in Africa, mm -hmm. and um, we are yet to be seen living and you know, up to that expectation. Um, once we were also called the largest uh, capital uh, company with the, I mean, country with the largest economy, but are we really truly what the world say we are? I don't think so. It's not really so. Uh, just yesterday, Mr. Bill Gates was advising my country to uh, economize what we have instead of spending money to buy vaccine for COVID-19. Why don't we spend our money to put our primary health care, which is the bedrock of health in Nigeria, in, in good shape and this everybody has been trying to i'm sure today the television stations the radio station the newspaper review they're going to be talking about what mr bill gates advised us why africa is in this mess um beats me my nation is 60 years old and we cannot boost of um a good health care system. Uh, you ha we have a three-tier system from the federal, state, and down to the local government. As we speak, the local government's level of health care is supposed to have the primary health care mm -hmm. system. We are at least, by data, up to 70% of the population should be accessing their health care but it's almost non-existent. We have primary health care centers, but you found the federal government putting money in primary health care. Isn't that anomaly? So the system we run, it's like um, one that is bedeviled with a lot of anomalies. Uh -huh. um, just uh, about three, four months ago, the system almost collapsed because the doctors were on strike. Mm -hmm. And missed COVID-19. I, can, I can't imagine what the people in your country are going through right now. We passed that stage. During Ebola, there was strike. COVID-19, there was, there was a strike. And you know when people get infected, in fact, before you even know whether you are infected, you fall sick. And your first spot of call, if you don't want to take care of yourself at home, is to go to any hospital. Private hospitals are expensive. 
and people are unable to pay out of pocket, which is what most of us do if you don't have health insurance. So you have to go to a public hospital. At the public hospitals, you find they are on strike. Then you resort to yourself, trying to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. As mm -hmm. we speak right now, the doctors are not on strike. The nurses, the health workers are not on strike in Nigeria. They are back at work. But we are having a challenge. And that challenge is that so many of them are getting infected. And maybe you heard a few weeks back, in one week, a hospital lost almost 20 doctors. A state lost almost 20 doctors. So if, and every day we are losing medical workers because they do not have sufficient uh, PPEs to protect themselves. Uh, patients coming to the hospitals, they are not telling the truth about their status. You know, stigmatization is there. So everybody is like protecting oneself. And when you get to the hospital, the person you are going to, the first uh, responder you are going to meet is not protected. You are not telling the truth as a patient. Everyone is at risk. So the doctor trying to save your life or the nurse trying to save your life or even the, the, the record, uh, record officer trying to get your record, is trying to save your life, is infected. Who looks after the patient? That mm -hmm. is the problem we are having at the moment. Okay, Yinkas, before I let you go, you say the healthcare workers are currently back at work. What Were their grievances met by the government? They, they, called, they called off the strike because they said they wanted to give the government time to work out. It's, the, it's a circle. It's always the same story. The government is still saying we are working out to meet your expectations, to meet your demand. Give them another month or two. If the expectations are not met, you find them going back again. It's always the circle. It's always the same, the same pain. Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the, the, the budget had been signed by Mr. President on 31st of December. We back, Nigeria is back to January to December uh, mode of operation. So the, 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 the budget has just been signed and we are expecting, this is the first month almost ending, we are expecting the budget to become implementable in a few, well, maybe by February or so. Mm -hmm. Perhaps mm -hmm. that explains why there is still some level of um, uh, quiet in the system. Okay. Maybe mm -hmm. once the budget becomes uh, uh, implemented, the federal workers will start getting the state will start getting their pay. You know, at the end of January, when their pay comes in and um, they don't see what they expect, probably by February they will jeering up again. But right, right now, we, they are waiting. All right. Yankers Shakunbi, we will keep in touch even as our situation keeps unfolding in as far as the healthcare system in Nigeria is concerned and the welfare of the healthcare workers. She is a health news editor joining us all the way from Nigeria and clearly just listening to her issues of prioritization of the healthcare seem to be bedeviling not only Kenya but also Nigeria and other African countries. Now we're bringing this conversation to a close and uh, even as I take the the last remarks from our panelists this morning. I'll start off with you, Alan. We just saw the pilot of the UHC. And uh, a lot of people were saying this would be it. This is when all Kenyans will be able to enjoy their right to health. Now that it ended unceremoniously, where do you see us going forward? And do we have hope in making the system better? I'm a very optimistic person. Uh, the idea behind UHC is a very noble one. But I think the manner in which it's been carried out has not been uh, quite successful mm -hmm. for the four things I'd mentioned earlier. Because uh, the financing for the whole thing wasn't looked into properly. And then uh, the aspect of uh, infrastructure also wasn't put into place. I got the chance to work in one of the pilot counties where the, the, the thing was being carried out. The other thing is uh, how the human resource aspect has been uh, dealt with. And uh, the other thing that has been a thorn in the flesh is commodity and supply. You've had a lot of gaps. 
to have uh, supply today, tomorrow we don't have them. And uh, we'd hope that uh, by piloting this phase, we would learn from the challenges so that when we roll it out to the whole country, this will be a success. Uh, COVID has taught us one thing, that uh, we must invest in health. You reap what you sow. If we have to get uh, a very high level standards of health, we must pump in resources in it and put it as a priority. We must also look at it in terms of productivity because you can only get uh, a healthy and productive nation if it's healthy. Uh, COVID came and our, com co our economy came crumbling because people can't work because they're healthy, they can't go to their places of work. So everyone looking at health must look at it from the point that if you have a sick nation, you will not be productive, you will not grow. So mine is uh, let's really take care of the the welfare of the, the, the healthcare workers for two reasons. That One, if you don't take care of uh, the healthcare workers and their needs, then it means that uh, productivity will go low. And then uh, we'll also have attrition because someone who is not motivated to work will find ways to leave the system. But then the second thing is that uh, we must protect these people because if you don't protect them, then they become a risk factor. Mm -hmm. They can spread the disease to the community. If they are not protected at their places of work, they can still spread the disease to the community. So all reasons must be put in place to make sure that our healthcare workers are protected, they're motivated, and they're allowed to work. Uh -huh. Abidan, what are your parting shots even as we ensure that we end this vicious cycle? Yeah, thank you, Gladys. Now, as you might have realized, our priorities are all lopsided. Uh, we won't, won't mention specifics, but I mean, we live in this country and we know. Uh, partly because our leaders don't have to face the consequences of their bad decisions. If there will come a time where healthcare is totally, I mean, just public and there is no, uh, I mean, that's a long shot. But then I think they will uh, get a pinch and they'll jump into action and stop sitting on a very able hands. Uh, as to say, uh, we need to be serious. There are 2,000 unemployed doctors, yet you're facing a very acute shortage. Some have been ravaged by natural attrition, others uh, by now by COVID. We need to get these 2,000 doctors back to work. And in as much as UHC was focusing much more on infrastructure, mm -hmm. it will just be brick and mortar if we don't take uh, into concern uh, the human resource aspect of it. Because healthcare is, is, is a service industry. You can't just build hospitals and paint them white and blue and expect that now service will be delivered. We need to take into concern the human resource aspect of it. Uh -huh. And Anne, your parting shot. Kindly and mute yourself. Okay. Have you unmuted yourself, Anne? Okay. We seem to have lost Anne's uh sound but uh i'm sure that uh, she will be speaking to us even if it's online to give her parting shot on behalf of the kenya national union of nurses but as you've heard from the health practitioners themselves that it is important that you cater for their welfare because at the end of the day they're human beings and if they are of sound mind and they're working in conducive environments they are able to cater for you as a monainchi optimally so how do we end this vicious cycle meet their needs and by extension meet the healthcare needs of this country well a big thank you dr alan ochanji vice chair camp pdu uh, Abidan Mwachi, who is the Secretary, KMPD Coast Branch, and of course, Anna Witi, who is the Secretary, Kenya National Union of Nurses at the Kisumu Branch. We also say a big thank you to Yinkas, who was joining us all the way from Nigeria, as I mentioned earlier. We'll keep in touch even as we understand better how your uh, healthcare system is being managed amidst this pandemic. Well, my colleague, Kiprop, will be joining us in a moment, even as he 
takes us through something that's very critical, especially at this time, and it is the hygiene that has been said to be the first line defense against contracting COVID-19. So how can we ensure that each and every person can access and even the schools can also access clean water? Find out in a moment. Go beyond with Kenya's fastest 4G network, Popote. Dial star 544 hash to get your data deal of the day. Let's see what they're developing right now. Molfix really pants with anatomic fit technology. New Molfix pants, an invention from babies for babies. You should also try Molfix. Siku ya leo tuko na successful bida wacha tumjue. Kumajira naitwa Michael Madheri Matere. Yes, kutoka Ngechari Muru. Nina bagani ya shini na unique ulitumia dio uweze kubid. Namba yangu ilikuwa 1169. Uko na hiyo pesa? Eh niko nayo hapa. Ah sio reta leta hiyo. Receipt yake dio hiyo. Eh. Kifunguo dio hiyo. How low can you go? Unaweza enda chini. Mpaka wapi? Bid. Bid, bid, now. I mean, now. This is Fact Finder from the BBC. Africans in diaspora are trooping to Ghana. We look at how the media is covering the year of return. Africa Check digs into claims about Nigeria's garbage problem. We'll tell you what they found out. I think it cut across and affected very many people and a lot of people are concerned. We hear from a Kenyan investigative journalist who tells us what it took to produce an explosive expose. And a dance moves choreographed by artificial intelligence. The man behind it says it enhances dancers' creativity. with Sensodyne Rapid Action for clinically proven relief in 60 seconds. Our guest left her accounting job to venture into a business she was only passionate about. So in our church, we don't do makeup and here wow. I want to do makeup because back then there was like no more because no one was doing makeup. Actually, you couldn't do makeup. So I knew like if I don't do it now, I will never do it. With no mentor, no capital and no skill, career went beyond. Yani alikiuka to make a name and livelihood for herself. Kidogo kidogo, yeah, I'm started to have my own clients. Though I didn't, talk, I did not have a makeup kit. No, I used to borrow. <laughs> Guys, so how do you go to a client without a makeup kit? Having already made major strides in business, bad one and kukiuka, which means going beyond and being extraordinary. I had some ways not advised to sleep with makeup on. Ah, that's the worst thing you can do to your face. To Zidina Hustle in association with Safaricom.
All right, welcome back to Your World on NTV Kenya this morning. In this segment, we'd like to continue our discussion and our assessment on the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the economy, on our businesses, and how 2021 is uh, likely to look like for the economy. And with us in studio is Mrs. Um, Pauline Shabi. She's the in charge of marketing at Ramroad Tanks. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Good. Let's delve right into it. 2020 and uh, the coronavirus pandemic was just, no one was spared, if uh, I, I can say so. And uh, I just wanted to get a feel uh, from where you sit, how was it like for you? Oh, like Ramrod Tanks, we are overwhelmed. As we produce these hardware stations, we never expected this would happen. We had some stock uh, in our place, but it was very overwhelming because most likely we are like the only people who are producing these hardware stations, but you could not supply at the meantime, but we have to do a lot to supply all the customers and meet their needs at the point. And even before you go into the um, hand wash uh, machines, uh, you are a manufacturer of, of, of water tanks. Yes. How was the, the pandemic like? Um, for, for the most obvious, um, of course, impact for many businesses was um, uh, suppressed demand. Is that something that you experienced? Yes. Like in our storage, you have so many tanks, but uh, we like have like 30 liters up to 10,000 liters, whereby we had like cylindrical vertical, that is um, basically round tanks. We also had like uh, um, rectangular, these are called loft boxes. So we could supply them. We could also have like 60 to 1,000 um, loft tanks whereby people could buy and put taps. We also had enough tanks to supply for water storage, yes. Back to my point, uh, the, the point was for many businesses, they, because people had to shift, uh, people lost their jobs, they had to shift the little um, money they had for other things like paying rent and, and buying food, and in the end they had to perhaps stop some of, uh, buying some of these things that are not uh, so much of necessities. Did yes. you see... Uh, a slowdown in the number of people buying uh, from you? Okay, people are not ready for what was happening, but with the time, they had to buy because there was no option. They had to put the measures according to the Ministry of Health. They had to put the hardware stations, something to, to wash their hands, running water. So somehow it was like confusion, but later we picked up and were able to supply. Mm. And people came in number, queuing for the hardware station and buying the tanks for water storage. Yes. I'll come back to that, but in, in terms of uh, the business that you run, how uh, did the, the virus impact you? Did you have to perhaps send, uh, maybe lay off some of your employees? Uh, did you have to perhaps slow down uh, production? Okay, we want to thank God for the camp because we never laid down staffs. Actually, we had to increase some laborers, the day wages, the, the day wages, guys, because there was a lot of production. We actually were very overwhelmed, so we could not lay down the staff, but increase somehow. So unlike, uh, so you, what you're saying is unlike uh, for other businesses which saw um, a slowdown in demand for their products, you, on the other hand, saw it was increased demand? Yeah, it was increased demand. Ah, the okay. demand was high and the supply, supply was low in the meantime, but you had to increase some staff. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what did it mean for you as a, as a business, business, more like a, um, a blessing in disguise? Yes, the, bless, the blessedness was good for us. As a landlord. Good. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think this is very important because during the in the fight of against COVID nineteen, the most important factor was sanitation. And uh, sanitation cannot be separated without uh, cannot be separated from water and cannot be separated from uh, tanks. Is this uh, something that you took advantage of um, as a business? Yes. Okay. Um, come again, come again, sorry. Yes, my, my, my question was, um, during the, the fight against the coronavirus pandemic, it was, um, sanitation was very necessary, and sure. that means having enough water. Yes. And having enough water, even in places with, where there is scarcity of water, means having storage tanks. Yes. Uh, and that means perhaps you, as you mentioned earlier, it was some sort of a blessing in disguise. Yes. Is this something that you took advantage uh, yes. of as a business? Yes. We could even, like... Okay, offer free deliveries. This is production and services. We are able to offer free deliveries to our clients. We are able to promise them that we supply in time. So we are efficient in deliveries. We also give good quality. People like our product because our product are durable, they were reliable, they are double-rayed, and also they were 
eco-friendly. This means the human, the environment was human friendly. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Staying with the, the delivery, um, the door-to-door -door delivery of your products, um, w one of the other factors during this uh, pandemic period was human-to-human <coughs> uh, -human interaction was discouraged by the government. Yes. And uh, most businesses had to, sh to shift their operations online yes. and to kind of uh, perhaps deliver uh, these goods to their, do their, their okay. clients' doorstep to make sure that they reduce that human-to-human uh, -human interaction. What was it like for you? Okay, for us, we used to equip our drivers uh, when they are delivering. And also we could do door-to-door, -door, whereby we could deliver. We have put our drivers and the um, turn boys um, they were well equipped with the material, like mask, mask. They had sanitation. They had also, the way they were wearing, they could not get in touch with other people. So we had even the thermal gun, we could take their temperatures. They were well equipped, and we made sure the machine and screens are all over the factory, and they are coming in and going out. So what so you're saying is you were able to, to sustain your operations yes, even yes. during the pandemic? Yes. Good. But the biggest lesson for um, many businesses during that period was uh, to continue to stay in operations, you have to innovate and yes. uh, find a way of responding to uh, the challenges that came with the virus so that you can uh, stay in business. If you don't innovate, you die. Yes. How was it like for you? How did you respond? Okay. Like as we had put in place hard wash stations, we like to, to, to avoid this COVID and interaction, we had food operated hardware stations whereby you step on for sabuni you step on for water so it was person to person individual interaction with water and hard wash we had varieties like we had so many hard wash stations station all over whereby the people could not be close to each other we kept their distance i actually meant in terms of the products that you offer did you have to in any way perhaps change the design uh, yes. manufacture different products which their yes. demand was 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 mm -hmm. higher that period yes we had like hardware station ranging from 30 liters to 100 liters we had them like uh, foot operated we had them with all sanitization like soap water running running very fast and also they were kept at a distance they kept a distance number two we had like dust beans we had them wheel dust beans whereby you step on we had to so variety of things. We had taught um, traps whereby you can throw the the waste from a distance. Yes. Mm. Yeah. What was the, uh, talk to us about the demand for these products during the uh, pandemic period? Everything was on high demand. Actually, we are very busy throughout, up to date. Mm. Yes. And for many businesses, uh, during this period is when they saw their revenues. Uh, to perhaps uh, the rock bottom. How was it like for you then? Uh, with, of 